in crypto to this particular uh, to slide and we can start tracking them. So I'm, I'm glad that uh, I was able to show this to you for a minute. Now, given the timing, I think what we need to do is uh, I'd like to introduce our next presentation, a presentation discussion really, which is called AI, the end of work. And it's uh, being led by Gordon Withrow, who is being joined by a number of different people. Gordon, you could probably share your screen now. It's being joined by, joined by Scott, Nancy, Alex, Loredana, and Emma. All right, and are you seeing my visuals? Yes, perfect. Okay. It's over to you, Gordon. Thank Great. you. Thank you, Lindsay. And uh, while we're having folks join and just getting started, I'll just ask uh, everyone, if you do have questions as we go, please send those to us in the chat. And between Lindsay and I, we'll try to capture those. And presuming we don't get too long-winded, we'll have some time at the end for Q&A, and we'll try to address those at that time. Uh, but thank you guys for joining us today, uh, guys and gals. This is Artificial intelligence, the end of work. Uh, I was inspired by an article I read, as we all often are, uh, on this topic. And I started going deep on the research I'd been doing and some of the people I have been influenced by and have these conversations with. And when the day of the swan came up, I said, this may be the opportunity for us to go do this publicly and share some uh, thoughts, get some additional input. So. That's why we're here and we thank you folks for joining and uh, being a part of it. Uh, let me just quickly introduce the panelists and uh, I'll start with Alex. Uh, Alex Sato is uh, the founder of Alliance for AI and uh, he comes to us uh, also, he was recently a leader in NVIDIA's AI business and he just moved into a consulting role with Bain and Company. So welcome Alex and thank you for joining us. Uh, Next, I'll introduce Nancy Roberts, who is an ethical AI specialist and a consultant with her company, Umbrella, and she's also a technology lead with a consulting organization called Maverick. Thank you, Nancy, for joining and welcome. Uh, losing my visuals. There we go. Next, uh, Scott Channels. Scott is a distinguished engineer with uh, Deep Instinct, and he is one of those fellows who works with an organization that's widely known as a cybersecurity firm that was one of the early pioneers of deep learning in threat detection. So uh, thank you for joining the panel today, Scott, and, and welcome. Okay, next is Emma Withrow. Now, there's an interesting similarity in our last names. That's no mistake. Uh, she's a person I have these conversations with pretty regularly, and uh, her credentials are she's an ad administration uh, executive uh, administrator in education now in the U.S. and formerly for a British school in Tokyo. Uh, she also recently completed a management role in a consulting company where they were using natural language processing to augment the work of an entire roster of transcriptionists doing work for the government. Uh, so some of that money that Jim was concerned about in the prior hour was going to help fund that business. So we thank them for that. But uh, at any rate, thank you for joining us today, Emma. Next is uh, Laura Donna Phillips, and she's with NEC Australia, and she is joining us live from Australia, where it's presently 1 a.m., so if you folks have your reaction buttons available, give her a, a celebratory uh, salute there, if you will. Uh, so I have assembled a panel that covers three continents and citizenship for at least five nations, and we're going to build, uh, hopefully, a broad and diverse panel that can cover this topic both globally and comprehensively uh, from a sense-making perspective. All right, so with that, I'm gonna get into some setup comments and try to put this conversation into context that will make sense for us as we talk through uh, some of the pros and cons to where AI is leading us and will it, what will it do to our work so as you can see here, the premise, I was honored to deliver a guest lecture at the Ohio State University a couple of weeks ago. And one of the things I told those young minds was that they really didn't need to worry about AI taking over the world and eliminating their opportunity to move into the workforce because, uh, you know, based on these questions, because the cybersecurity threats that we're all seeing, we're going to wipe out society as we knew it before that happened. And that was a joke, of course, but uh, the point is that just like this pandemic with COVID-19 we're coping with right now, there are always things 
that hamper the delivery of the future that everyone predicts. There's a, one of the Michael Jordans, not number 23, Michael I. Jordan, who is uh, one of the foremost authorities on AI and machine learning. He said recently, for the foreseeable future, computers are not going to be able to match humans in their ability to reason abstractly about real world situations. So I think I thought that was a good quote to, to frame where we are in this journey toward artificial intelligence. Because when we talk about AI, we're really today talking about the advances that are associated with machine learning, deep learning, neural networks that accomplish some pointed contextual learning and results. And in the future, our ability to truly achieve the promise of AI is going to be more and more realized. And yet there's likely to be limitations that minimize the achievement of this promise of a truly rational reason that's accomplished via AI in the very near future. So these advances, while they're not living up to the full science fiction vision, they will, however, rapidly reshape our world. And some of it goes on in the background where we don't see it, so we don't know what's going on, like a lot of technology advances. So today, we want to walk through this, this coming change by answering three questions that are framed around this outcome relative to work. First, will this be the end of work, or is AI just going to augment it? If it will be the end of work, if you want to lean that way, all right, which portions? And if it won't end work, and which pieces, then which pieces won't go away? So that's our premise, and I hope that makes some sense. I hope everything makes sense. 82% uh, is somehow a magical number because a 2019 study by Oracle found that 82% of respondents think that robots can do certain work better than their managers. And a 2018 study by Deloitte found that 82% of AI adopters expect moderate or substantial job changes for their employees in three years. So quickly doing the math, we are there. We're, now, we're there now and it is happening. So as AI ch is changing how companies work, who does this work is also going to change. Uh, so the great likelihood is that organizations are going to begin to replace human employees with intelligent machines and numbers that we just can't yet predict. And it's already happening. Intelligent systems are displacing humans in manufacturing. We've seen that for years. Service delivery is now taking roles and jobs and, and simplifying the ones that are left. Uh, recruitment is being automated. Uh, financial industry is, is having huge automation through artificial intelligence take place in the background where we don't see it. And consequently, this all moves human workers toward lower paid roles or makes them unemployed. Uh, a, um, a McKinsey study estimated that 6% of workers, particularly those in uh, low wage roles, may need to find new jobs because of both automation and the pandemic. And what, what I see from this, uh, spending so much time in delivery of new technology and performing uh, leadership roles and transformation is that there's never a stop the world moment where technology advances can just go quickly through a switch. What I would submit to you is that this pandemic has created nearly a moment where that could happen. Because after everybody swallowed hard and figured out what it would take to stay in business, and how to enable their employees to continue their work in some way, they then said, oh, now what do we do? Well, it looks like the world's changing on us. We better go double down on some of this stuff we've been talking about. And what I want you to know is they have, and it is going to accelerate. So that's the perspective I'm, I'm coming at this with. Alex is likely going to speak to this a little later. I hope we have time for that. Uh, I'm sure he'll probably allude to this in his comments. And no pressure, Alex, if you don't, but I'm just, I love this research you've done that's given us a recognition that should we not become intentional about educating and preparing ourselves for coming changes to employment, uh, the gap between populations of people that are able to uh, sustain a middle-class lifestyle is only going to get wider. And it's that middle-class lifestyle where much of the world's stability in governments and peacefulness rests. So technology advancements are rising fast 
and ed yet education and policy advances are slow. So we really can't miss the opportunity and the responsibility to manage this relative to artificial intelligence and the advances that are coming. And really, like all the other technology advances that we've seen, it's like, okay, we'll catch up. I think this one's different. I think the ability to catch up uh, may pass some people unnecessarily. And not just organizations, not just uh, companies or departments and companies or brands, but entire people groups could get passed by this. So that's what we're trying to draw attention to. Uh, at the most recent World Economic Forum, Dan Huttenlocker, who's the Dean of the MIT College of Computing, and he's also a board chair of the MacArthur Foundation, he observed that AI can help us leapfrog some of the societal challenges that we face, but we have to design it to do that. There's no such thing as a good technology in and of itself. We've got to make it work for us. And the key I see is that it remains down to us as business leaders, technologists, scientists, agents of change to drive the use of these technologies to the ends that we can achieve with them. And our challenge is really to harness the power and to ready ourselves for the next wave of work and displacement of work uh, because it's coming. Here's a simple positive example. There's a nonprofit called the Common Market that uses AI to improve its food supply chains between farmers, growing networks, and food banks. Uh, now, this common market I'm talking about actually exists in Texas and the Southeast and the Mid-Atlantic. Uh, so I didn't have a good picture for that, but I love this picture to highlight uh, food supply chain. And the point is you could apply AI to this, but there's a whole host of things happening here that maybe will give you a clue to where work will or won't be eliminated. But this is a great example of a point solution that AI can provide this, this uh, Texas and Southeast common market where AI can provide more and more capability that really enhances our ability to protect the society we want, build the one that we wish for. So in as, in as little as 10 years, AI could generate enough wealth to pay every adult in the US $13,500 a year. I don't know if you guys saw that quote recently, that came from OpenAI CEO, Sam Altman. Uh, and he came out with this thing he calls Moore's Law for everything. So, you know, that makes me, yeah, you familiar with that one? Yeah. So yeah. I, I see that and I ask myself, are we just all going to hang out with our VR glasses on and drink coffee all day? Is that where we're headed? Because we all get this basic living, you know, some of us would say, okay, I'm in. Others would say, what are you kidding me? Uh, I can't create. I need to create. Uh, but critics are concerned that his views could cause more harm than good because he's misleading the public on where AI is heading. Global decisions on how to manage our way through the disruptive changes to business that are coming from AI are going to be different everywhere. So while this example, maybe a U.S. example, sounds good to a whole lot of people, uh, think governments and taxation and freedom to create wealth is different everywhere, uh, hearkening back to Jim's prior session. So you know, Beth Singler, who's an anthropologist, uh, anthropologist at uh, Cambridge, I don't know, uh, Nancy, if you're familiar with her work or not, but uh, she studied uh, AI and robots, and she was on a CNBC interview recently, and she asked the question, are we going to get Star Trek luxury space pseudo-communism, or are we going to get wall-e redundancy? And, you know, I don't know which of those we would choose if it was a binary situation, but Either or both scenarios could play out depending on where you live, depending on what government you live under, depending on how money is controlled. And, and so this is different for all of us. That's why this is a global question that doesn't have a single answer. And that's why we're attacking this question from the, the angles we are. If things are gonna be eliminated, which ones first and why and how? And if they're not gonna be eliminated, which ones and why? And how do we work our way through that so that we protect the society we want, build the one we, or protect the one we have, build the one we want. So this, thank you for listening to the diatribe to set context, but this sets the context, I hope, and leads us to our first question. And now I get to engage this wonderful panel. First question is, will artificial intelligence augment or eliminate jobs? And I'm gonna start Nancy, with you and ask you to jump in and take the first shot at this one. Yeah, sure. Um, 
Well, I mean, you know, the, fundamentally, AI has the potential to do either of those things. Um, can it augment jobs? It's already doing that. Can it eliminate jobs? It's already doing that. The question that's more interesting, I think, is as a society, what jobs do we want it to augment? What jobs do we want it to eliminate, if any? Um, and where do we want to have some protections around that or some, some thought around that? And I think we're really just on the nursery slopes of thinking about some of these issues. And, you know, there's a lot of fear and misrepresentation around AI, which obviously a lot of the conversations today will hopefully, um, you know, not, <laughs> not add to, but rather debunk. Um, but, you know, I think there are, when you think about AI as a, as a force for positive good, it really changes how you think about these questions. Um, and I think there's not enough of that going on in the world at the moment. AI is seen very much as a way for companies to make money or save money or be, you know, increase their profit margins. And of course, AI can do all of those things. But as a society, I think we need to say, what are the limits that we want to put on that? Or what are the constraints that we should be thinking about in that conversation? So, um, you know, my, my big concern around this is that you know, globally, a lot of the investment that's going into AI is going in, in along very traditional routes. So your Silicon Valley startups, um, you know, the kind of offshoots of Google and people like that. And the challenge that that presents for AI development is that we know that there's a huge amount of bias in how that investment is handed out to founding teams. So, you know, less than 1% of um, funding in the UK goes to female founded businesses, female founded technology businesses. I know in the US, something like what only one or 2% of um, investment in startups goes to companies founded by people of colour. And so the problem is that by pushing money into the pipes of all of these startups, we are creating a very undiverse, a very homogenous um, set of people working on questions of AI technology who are solving, you know, in many cases, first world problems. I mean, I've seen AI technology um, being used to help you find a parking space in a, in a busy town centre. Now, I'm not saying that we wouldn't all like to be able to find a parking space when we've got stuff to do, but is that really the best use of this, of, of the, you know, the potential of AI? And is that what we should be funding? Or should we be funding people who can help us to think about what we want AI to do for the world and to do for society? Um, and I think just, just to sort of finish on that point, I think we have to stop thinking about AI in regional terms, which is why it's great to see such a diverse panel and such a diverse group of people on the chat as well. Because, you know, somebody sent me an article yesterday about um, some EU legislation that they were looking to put around AI. And, you know, that's not going to solve the problem because yeah, how, is, how is there going to be artificial intelligence, which me sitting here in Britain can't access um, because of some EU regulation and what happens if everyone else in the world is following very different regulation. So I think we have to... We have to step up our view a little bit on this and think about what's the impact that AI could have on the future of work globally, as you alluded to, Gordon, um, and how do we prevent some of the, the problems that we already have being replicated and, in fact, accelerated by AI? Um, and that is a question, I think, that needs forums like this, where people can come together globally and think about the solutions rather than just individual organisations and corporates solving their own problems or, you know, making money for themselves. Yes. So that's my my starting point. <laughs> yeah, I, thank you, Nancy. I, I agree. And I think I'm going to ask Alex to jump in next because I think, like yourself, he takes that global view of this and uh, yet localized understanding. Uh, Alex, what, you, what are your thoughts? Is uh, AI going to augment or eliminate jobs? Yeah, definitely. I can add some more color to the, you know, brilliant contributions of Nancy just now. I mean, from, from where I sit, you know, every day AI is helping people, um, you know, solve problems in completely new ways that are cheaper and faster. You know, uh, one, one person can now do things that, you know, it used to take hundreds to do. And so, yes, humanity can do so much more. We're all excited about this. I mean, we, you know, we're able to discover the COVID-19 vaccine faster. AI did play a role in some of that, you know. But however, as Nancy started to call out, uh, uh, oh, billions of people who are, you know, say scared of changing, or, or don't have access or, or don't have enough time to learn. Uh, and so they want to continue the old ways of doing things. Uh, those folks will, will lose their jobs because it would be just too expensive. Uh, no one operating with today's capitalistic values will employ them. Uh, and what this means is that for those who adopt the AI, they will, they will have an easier path into the top 1%. Uh, but then for the billions who don't or who can't, 
uh, they become poorer, and that will lead the world to, to have much uh, worse, uh, you know, economic divide. I mean, just look outside institutions like today, for example. You have uh, people who are on the path to becoming extremely wealthy, but then in front of their campus is homeless, right? Uh, it's just going to get much worse. The world is uh, that that world we we are, we are creating. All of us is, is a world that is imbalanced and incredibly dangerous. I think all of us. So we have to be aware of this uh, and know what we want to do in our future. Great. Thanks, Alex. Uh, Laura Donna, you want to tack on a little experience from uh, Asia Pacific? Yeah, look, I mean, I think, um, I don't think this is an either or situation, but rather looking at it as a both. Um, and, and I think, especially in the West, we sometimes have this tendency to look at AI like it's scary and new. Um, but in actual fact, it's a continuation of technological advancement, which has throughout history kind of augmented, eliminated, or created new jobs in its wake. Um, and I think we no longer have, like, we look at people who no longer cut ice into blocks and ship it to England from Canada because we have refrigerators now. And um, like without planes, you don't have a whole aviation industry and the travel industry would be very different to what it was say pre COVID. So all technological advancement of which AI fits into is a continuation of this trend. Um, and in terms of augmentation and elimination of jobs more specifically, I think AI will affect jobs that can be automated differently than it will affect jobs that rely on human interaction and human compassion, say like within certain areas in education or healthcare. Um, and I think like echoing Nancy and, and the rest of the panel, we do as a society need to look at how I, AI is applied within the workforce and within society in general, and work to make sure that we have enough support available for people to be constantly retraining and reskilling, and we need to be very active in making sure that these gaps that we see today, which is between, for example, people with access to internet and those without access to internet, doesn't widen anymore. And you know, ideally, we do need to eliminate these gaps. Great, great. Uh, Emma, would you like to pile on? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I completely agree with what everyone said, and you know, to tack on from what Laura Donna was saying. Um, I see AI as mainly augmenting real, these roles that we have for most jobs. Um, what I do see it eliminating is a lot of tasks that go along with a job. You know, you think about reading an x-ray or um, filtering through student data to identify gaps in a student knowledge. You know, even in education, we're seeing that happening. But it's not going to replace the teacher role. It's simply going to augment that and provide more opportunities for things to be, you know, done quicker, provide more time for planning, more time for strategic thinking, instead of handling those kind of more mundane day-to-day -day tasks. Yeah, so as you were talking, I, I'm thinking about the example of the telephone operators when they no longer had to pull and punch the cords, they could focus on what the caller was trying to accomplish and help them make that connection. Uh, and there was an explosion in operators. Everybody thought the operators were gonna go away, but it, it, it enabled a price point where the telephony could take off and become ubiquitous. And uh, now, of course, we just grab these little um, Star Trek devices. But Scott, is there anything left? Uh, any contrarian views? Or are you agreeing uh, with some of this uh, com conversation you've heard so far? Thanks for being last on this question. Yeah, so, so being the last person on a panel to answer a specific question, the, the temptation is certainly to say, yeah, what they all said, but I won't let myself off that easy. However, I'll keep this short. I know we've got uh, some other stuff to cover. What I'll say is, I, like the other panelists, I think that what we do now, what we do today, can and will materially affect the outcome tomorrow. And to that end, may, maybe a call to action for, for all of us. If, if you've been in your profession, in your field for a fair number of years, and you have opportunity to mentor someone, take that opportunity. I, I would encourage that. You know, maybe it's a university student, maybe it's someone who's out of work that is interested in what you're doing. Go with them on the journey. I, I promise you it will, it, it's gonna pay huge dividends for all of us in the future. So that's really the only thing I wanted to add, Gordon. Okay, great. 
Well, I'm going to move us then quickly on to the next question. And uh, Scott, since you know, you know the saying, uh, the old saying, the first shall be last, the last shall be first. So now you get to lead off. Yes. This and uh, we'll yeah. Nancy uh, on the with the opportunity to say ditto. The next question really is, yeah, we've long since automated looms uh, to fulfill Aristotle's uh, statement, but you know, we, we've not covered every angle from the process uh, that involves from the moment it hits uh, sheep to you know husbandry of sheep all the way to it becoming a blanket. But that one part we've automated, okay. I see a similar trend for AI, but uh, maybe others don't. With that as a backdrop, Scott, what do you think is, which jobs are most susceptible to elimination due to AI advances? Yeah, so so honestly, I've been accused before of being a bit too sanguine on what AI is gonna do and how, and how this is gonna look in, in the years to come. Part of that, or, or largely that's due to the fact that I work in the cybersecurity field and, and candidly, AI has been far more of a blessing than a curse. That said, I do recognize there, there will be a, a, an effect on jobs. And I think my opinion would be the most at risk, the most heavily hit worker profile, if you will, will be what I would call the generalists, the jack of all trades, the factotum, whatever moniker you want to put on it. These are the folks, you know, when I, when I think about it in the cybersecurity context, we've been doing this for years, right? We knew there was going to be a skill shortage and a, and a talent shortage. So we started pulling, you know, let's, if we can recruit a help desk analyst or a data center operator, a, a system admin, a network admin, and they have interest and desire and drive, like, I want to learn what you're doing. We can teach them cyber. We can teach them ethical hacking. We can teach them coding. And, and I think... What I tell people when I talk about this is don't try to boil the ocean. If you want to code, go learn the a predominant language. Do do something, get very good at it, hone your craft, be the best that you can be at it. And and I believe it will be it'll be in your in your long term success if you if you approach it that way. Great. Uh, the um, I had a thought it escaped me, so I'm going to jump right on into Emma. I may come back to your your point, Scott. Uh, Emma, what do you think? Is it going to eliminate and which ones? Yeah, I think it definitely will unfortunately eliminate, but not entirely unfortunately. You know, Laura Donna made that really good point about we don't have people who cut ice anymore because we have the refrigerators. Um, that's opened up the opportunity for people to create said refrigerators, uh, do maintenance on them, sell them. That opens up a lot of other opportunities. So just because we're eliminating things doesn't mean that, you know, suddenly we're going to have giant populations of people who don't have uh, a vocation that they can fall back on. Um, but what's really important is to kind of really focus on that those vulnerable jobs, um, with them being typically more blue collar or predominantly filled by a minority population, uh, the big questions that we're going to have is that intentionality of that AI and making sure that um, there's representation at the table, both in the planning and in the implementation, so that we don't end up leaving large groups of people who either have less access or more difficulty access in uh, the future job market. Great. Lord Anna? Yeah, look, I mean, I think we can start to look at job roles that are in that process now. So um, some of the examples that came to mind for me were like self-service checkouts that are replacing people at these markets and other stores. And I mean, largely like Amazon and other online shopping is really seeing an upward trajectory, especially in the times of COVID. Um, and if you look at online comparison websites, they're essentially replacing a lot of travel agents. Um, as more people use apps to do things like banking and book appointments, you know, reception, bank tellers, those kinds of jobs are all jobs that are seeing changes in their roles, in the tasks that they perform on a daily basis. And numbers do impart to the technology available. That means the public are really able to undertake these tasks without as much human assistance from within the company as was previously needed. Um, and so what I think really becomes important is this ethical application of AI. And do we want or do we need to keep some of these jobs? Or if not, how do we go about making sure that the people in these changing roles are receiving enough training and support to be able to adapt to these changes and still stay within employment if that's what they so choose? 
Um, and I think the question then moves away from what will be eliminated, but to who within society sets these ethical standards. I mean, because uh, the rest of the panel will agree, and I'm sure people will bring that, this up themselves as well, but um, without enough diverse representation in the AI algorithms so far, we have seen biased algorithms come through or bias within these applications of algorithms come through. So how do we make sure these ethical applications of AI aren't biased going forward? Yeah, I, what a great point. I, I, I'm just thinking too, that back to my point that the, where the decisions are made is going to be different based on where you live and really who controls the money. And, mm. and so, you know, in, in what we'll call the free world and certainly just looking around the horn of our panel in the US and Canada and the UK and Australia, we're going to see he who controls the dollar and the market uh, will control uh, the AI. Uh, you go to other parts of the world, you may see uh, institutionalized controls at work surrounding an entire set of borders that decide those things. And they decide where the dollars are made, who makes them, and how much of that stays in the hands of the individual. Uh, so great point. I think that's, that's our challenge uh, that I'm taking so far out of this is because it's different everywhere, how do we do it? And how do we unite on that and, and make it work? Uh, so thanks for bearing with me on that. Nancy, uh, or sorry, Alex, you're next. Uh, what do you think? Yeah, no, I think the comments you made and, uh, you know, uh, Loredana earlier pretty resonate with me. It's like the simple answer is, you know, the job elimination doesn't just happen. It's, it's the people building the tools that choose, right? So, and that gets me very worried because the choices being made today excludes billions of people, literally, right? It's, it's really a function of what capabilities the tech companies decide to build. In, in, if I remember back three years ago in 2018, my team uh, made AI fast enough so that you could process video quickly. So uh, as an example, you know, that then starts to uh, begin the, the journey of uh, the jobs of, say, security guards uh, who look at video to, to uh, you know, it reduces the, the need for them to have a job. Uh, two years later, uh, you know, my team worked to, to make AI fast enough so that it could uh, understand language, for instance, right? And so that, again, begins the path for, say, translators to not need to have their job or, or, or maybe hopefully, like one of the panelists mentioned earlier, it just augments it and makes more people come into that job space. It's interesting to see how, how that evolves. Um, I personally am most worried about the fact that, I mean, as you can see in America, I am Black, and, and, and this issue affects uh, Black people the most. Um, I mean, the current global economic system has worked for over 400 years to, to place to place us in these jobs that now American and Asian developers are deciding to automate away. So uh, to, to reverse all this work is gonna take time. This systemic issue is gonna take time, but uh, for me, I'll continue to play my part in, in, um, in, 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 in trying to reverse this. Yeah, and I, I, uh, it's one of those things where when you're surrounded by, I'm just gonna say folks like us, folks who are uh, in the guild and folks who are contributing regularly to society to look out for these kinds of traps and these kinds of things that we need to overcome as a global society. You feel good about it, but you can't feel good about it because there's so much not still being done. No matter how aware we are, there's so much that still needs to be done. And because we are not the ones with the controls, maybe not enough in our own minds, we just let things pass. But that's why, you know, my call to action today, too, is, you know, Scott gave us one, go mentor somebody, go help somebody work their way into this. Mine is, if you have a passion for this, find a way to have an influence that matters uh, so that these things don't get left behind. And, and we're playing catch up again on yet another opportunity to, to change the world. But uh, Nancy, you want to close us out on this topic? Yeah, I mean, I think um, a lot of what Alex is saying is, is very much in line with the concerns I have around this. Um, you know, it, it's obvious that, you know, from what all of the panelists have said, that the jobs that are most susceptible are the ones which are traditionally held by, I guess, in whatever way you would frame the term, the underclass. So that might be black people, it might be um, in Britain, it might be white working class men, for example. Um, you know, so there's a real... There's a real question that we need to ask there, but I really like the way that Emma spoke about in the previous question about 
um, eliminating tasks, not jobs. And I think that's a really interesting way to think about it. You know, it's up to us to define what makes up a job. Um, and at the moment, they might be made up of lots and lots of tasks that may or may not be, you know, susceptible to automation, susceptible to AI. But we need to think about in the future, what is the role that a job should have? Um, and I think that picks picks up on what everybody in the panel has been saying, you know, those those things just become different and maybe in the future become more about, um, you know, thinking about these ethical issues, not just kind of doing a task. Um, so, you know, I think I think everyone's covered my points, but I just wanted to kind of like emphasize that um, that important distinction between tasks and jobs, which, again, we have a choice around. We don't have to say we don't we no longer need factory workers. We might be able to say we need factory workers to do something different from what we considered them to do in the, in the past, for example. Um, and again, these are choices that we can make, but we need much more people at the table, much more diversity of people at the table making the choices, which I think is a point that Alex made very well. Excellent. I'm going to move us right on and come back to you, Nancy, quickly. Um, Harvard Bus Business Review offers some perspective on this next question, that many people are working with smart machines in their daily work, but few have lost their jobs to them. Uh, so contrary to AI abilities that are only responsive to the data available, humans have this ability to imagine, to anticipate, to feel, and to judge changing situations, which allows them to shift from short-term to long-term concerns in ways that our, our machines can't do. So these abilities are unique to humans and don't require a steady flow of externally provided data to work in that is the case with artificial intelligence as we know it today. So as, as we look at that as a backdrop for some things not being eliminated, we may have already answered this question by virtue of op answering the other side of it, but let's go back and hit it hard quickly. Uh, what are the roles that are least likely to be eliminated as AI advances? Um, Nancy? Yeah, I mean, I think it, it leads on from what we were talking about, you know, the flip side of the kind of automation of tasks and things is, is what that leaves behind is much more around that human and ethical um, dimension. So, you know, perhaps what we used to term soft skills around understanding how people relate and understanding how we want society to work and understanding what motivates us um, as humans and what, what, you know, drives us to make the world better, for example. So I think, you know, you could, you know, you could see that things like, jobs in the creative industries, for example, might, might be less affected in the short term um, because they're much more about human connection, human, you know, the kind of things you were talking about, Gordon, our ability to see into the future, our ability to envisage different scenarios, things like that. We, we may be still in a, in a world where humans do that best. Um, but again, there will be tasks around that which might disappear. So if I think I did a PhD in literature, and at the time, you know, the only way to do that was to read every book you could get your hands on and then make your own assessment of what those books were about. Um, whereas now I could take all of that content, run it through a natural language processing um, piece of software, and it's going to tell me here are terms and themes and ideas which recur. So, you know, some of that role goes away, but what doesn't go away is the judgment and the insight that you would then take with that information to do something useful with it for society. Um, so, yeah, I think, you know, it's, as we've said, it's about tasks, not necessarily roles, but it's also about the new roles that we'll have. And, and one thing I'd really like, you know, I guess my little call to action in this, in this question is, I'd really like to see more people from um, the creative industries, from philosophy, from ethics, those kind of people getting very involved in AI, um, because that, those are the voices which are often not heard or are missing, um, as we've alluded in some of the other questions, you know, there's, there's a homogeneity around who's at the table developing AI. Um, and I think we need people who see the world differently um, and who are not just using technology to solve a problem, but are understanding the potential future implications of what that technology might do and helping us to think as a society about what we, you know, <laughs> what we want that to do. So, um, you know, I'd love to see the creation of roles like AI ethicist, AI philosopher, AI um, future thinker, whatever you want to call it, but people who are not just coding, they are thinking, what do we want the world to look like when we've got this technology doing what we want? So that's, I guess, a little um, call to action for me. Great, great. Alex? Yes, yes. Uh, to build on top of that point and reiterate my previous point, right? So the developers, uh, you know, the developers and then those who decide to hold them accountable uh, you know, like like values, investors or government or even customers, you know, 
these are the collective group that's going to decide what jobs uh, won't get innovated away. Um, in terms of what current trends are starting to show, uh, there should be jobs, uh, you know, that are supporting the infrastructure, like in the data center or systems engineering, uh, you know, the infrastructure of AI. There should be more jobs in, in, in terms of like regulating the use of AI, you know, like like was just mentioned, previous speaker, and um, jobs in, say, designing the new digital spaces where it looks like humanity is going to be spending more of their time that it'd be a huge opportunity in the design space. Um, final point here for me is um, I am pretty excited about the jobs, potentially millions of jobs that, that can be created, you know, with, uh, you know, as AI tools make it easier to complete tasks. Uh, you know, for example, probably there'll be a million more people who can become doctors and bring care to more people, right? Uh, that That's possible. And, and that's the this is the realm that, that we are exploring uh, more in the African continent and I'm excited about. Great, yeah, I was uh, reading an article recently about uh, doctors who are now using AI where an assistant listens in on uh, a patient visit and effectively records the context. Every, they record everything, but they put it in the context of what just happened and they, they type it up effectively. So the doctor doesn't have to spend 10 minutes with a patient and 15 minutes typing it all up before you can see the next patient, he or she, but really can just review the notes that the AI generated and say, yeah, that's it, click, done, go see the next patient. So for, for doctors who didn't want to spend all day typing uh, or half their day typing, uh, it, it, it empowers them to do more. And uh, so there, it's definitely a situation where augmentation is occurring already. Uh, and we've all seen the, the visits, uh, doctor visits over Zoom, et cetera, uh, telemedicine that's occurred just through the pandemic. So interesting things are happening there with augmentation. Uh, Lordana, other opportunities you're seeing? Yeah, I think it's, it's interesting because, I mean, AI is much more prevalent than most people are aware of. Um, the average Australian woman interacts with AI something like 25 times a day. So if you think about like Netflix recommendations on what to watch, what you see in your feeds on social media, or even personal assistant applications like Siri or Alexa. These are all fairly mundane or like everyday uses of AI. So yeah. I think this goes beyond what jobs will continue to exist, but back into that augmentation of jobs, which is, I mean, really echoing what Emma and Nancy have already mentioned about this idea of tasks, not jobs. Um, so if you look at like where I am in today, so marketing today versus say in the 1980s, it's a really different job. Uh, in the 80s, you had much less media to advertise on. So you're looking at traditional media, radio, TV, newspaper. And roles like what I'm working in a lot of, which is the social media kind of specialist idea, they just didn't exist. So like where I'm working is a product of this new job or this augmented kind of role. And I think that's what we will see happen with AI, is this creation of new roles within existing disciplines. Um, but if we look at like, least likely to affect. I think AI is least likely to affect jobs that need compassionate human interaction. So areas within industries like healthcare, education, social services, these are industries where AI is already helping people in these professions to solve those complex problems. But what we can't underestimate is the value of human interaction in these job roles either. And those soft skills that really can't easily be replaced at this point in time by AI. Yep. Uh, Emma? Yeah, to sort of, again, piggyback off of Lordana, I, I certainly agree with all of that. Um, it's that abstract human element that's going to be that final thing to be eliminated or perhaps not eliminated. Um, you know, you think of that naturally human component of that strategic thinking, and that's going to be really tough to replace with AI. Um, we can see it, we can do it, and we're already seeing some glimpses of that in our, you know, current research set, uh, setting. But um, those jobs are a long way from being eliminated as a whole. Uh, we have yet to make AI interactions a social norm for ourselves. It feels very uncomfortable to talk to a robot on the internet when you know it's a robot. Um, we're not there yet. Um, you know, to, to counter Nancy's Star Trek reference, I'm going to use a Star Wars one. Um, mm -hmm. we, we can all envision a future with C-3PO everywhere uh, and interacting with those in our daily lives, whether that's in a school setting or in a hospital or doctor setting. Um, but yeah, we're just a long way off from that, first of all, happening, but also interacting with that and it being comfortable and a social norm for all of us. Um, if we want to look at when that might happen, I think it's important to pay attention to the younger generations, uh, Gen, Gen X, or no, sorry, Gen Z. 
uh, they're all growing up with AI completely around them and it's kind of normal for them a little bit more than it would be for even a millennial or older. Um, so it's really important to pay attention to that, gen that generation and how they are gonna be using AI, how they're gonna be interacting with it and their comfort level. So maybe a, a new job that's created out of this is someone who becomes a counselor for people to help them interact with AI in, in a genuinely significant way. Uh, and, and I use those words to paint a picture, but it probably wouldn't look anything like that. It wouldn't, wouldn't look like or feel like counseling, but it, it would be a, a pretty good uh, opportunity to use that human heart that we all have and crave uh, and we're all feeling as we get isolated through this pandemic and we talk to each other through video screens uh, and turn that into something that helps us engage this new way of work. Uh, Scott, on this question, last word. Yeah, so I, I'm going to veer off what I, what I was originally going to talk about because I'm loving the, the idea of how do we infuse ethics into the into AI and the decisions are being made. And at the risk of setting everyone's geek detectors off, I'll, I'll try to keep this high level. But when I think about the way we train AI models today, it, I think there's opportunity as we've sat and talked through this to, to actually get the right people involved when, when the models are being trained. Because let's face it, the, what, what we're looking at today, this so-called traditional machine learning, which is the predominant force in AI today, very, very reliant on human beings. It's very reliant on humans to feed, really spoon feed what that training cycle looks like. And I think if you could get, you know, I think uh, Nancy talked about the, the notion of an AI ethicist. I love that because you could, you could have the geek stuff going on, but then in, in somewhere infused in that training, we, we introduce this notion of, of where the ethics stand on what we're trying to do, how we're trying to train those AI models. The last thing I'll say is, and it's really piggybacking on what everyone else has said, but where we see these AI models failing today, and when I say failing, I mean, they do get it wrong. The machine will get it wrong, and it's going to be like that now and, and for, for, for the foreseeable future. When they get it wrong, the humans have to, have to come in and, and rescue the, the, the situation. And it's really because, the like we've said, the computers don't have this like humans have context clues and we've got, you know, we can connect all these data points in our brains in a split second and, and be able to, to contextualize and, and correlate some of these data points much more rapidly and far better than a machine's ever going to be able to do. So I'll leave it at that. Love this discussion. This has been fantastic. Great. Yeah. I, I was thinking about that as you were speaking about the training and right now I'm involved in training a, a deep learning engine and in that model, two key learnings. One is you find that even after hundreds of thousands of examples you give the machine, to your point, it, it's still going to uh, miss something and has to be made aware of this one little nuance. And that that failure is either hilarious or devastating, depending on what the context is. The second thing you learn is all the situations you thought you needed to train for because your, your current process requires monitoring and inspecting for certain things. And then when you go to train the engine, you can't find a single example. And you realize, I don't need to do that anymore because work has moved beyond that. The, the results we're getting as inputs don't require that anymore. So there's learning to be done just to train the, the engine, to train the machine. And that's been exciting to uh, participate in. Uh, so let's, let's move on to uh, Q&A. And uh, I have a couple that are kind of related. I'll, I'm going to hit the first one and then I'm going to take the second question I saw come up here uh, and get one of you folks ready to uh, speak to that while I give this first answer that I feel like I can handle. And then you guys can jump in if you like. But uh, maybe, Nancy, if you would pick up on uh, this question that as an individual, what can I do to prepare for the workplace of the future? We've talked around that a lot, but if, if, if I'll come back to you in a minute, you can answer that one. I want to hit these two questions that relate to uh, one, are people interchanging the meaning of AI and robotics and automation? And those are different things, yes. Along with thoughts on the singularity. And we we're kind of marching our way there. Here's the, the best example of all that that I keep thinking about that, that I have my mind trained on as we work toward that future. 
And it has to do with the scenario where uh, it's a scary scenario where machines are building machines. And we've, we've taken this to the point where the machines can build the machines. And this is one of the key premises of the singularity. But uh, what if the machines who build the machines are told to optimize with every resource they can get their hands on the building of machines? Because that's what their incentive is. And what if they have access to resources that run life-saving equipment? And they take that machine that's running life support away from people or food supplies for people just because they have access to it. Nobody walled it off and they take it and use it to build more machines. That's, that's an almost innocent yet pro possible example. It's not an evil intent of the machine. It's just a machine doing what the machine was trained to do and using all the resources it can get its hand on, hands on. So this, this whole notion of AI that everybody does get clouded and talks about from a science fiction perspective we're actually trying to demystify that a bit with this conversation in ways that help you understand that everything that is going on right now will contribute to that someday, is contributing to that in some ways, and in ways that every time you hear about a new instance, you're like, wow, that's spooky that they can do that now, and, and it is happening. But uh, we're still quite a ways off from having to fear uh, being a, a, a battery for the matrix. How's that? Uh, my opinion. Other thoughts are opinions that that has spurred for some of the panelists you'd want to jump on that or disagree with me nobody's going to touch it okay <laughs> nancy what do you think a, about a very very quick thought if that's yeah, okay go ahead. ai versus robotics versus automation i mean i think they're all quite different but ai is used to make robots smarter yeah. and, and ai is used to drive automation so i, I see it as okay for us to be talking about them. And about singularity, that's still, say, people predict in many decades away, but in my view, it doesn't matter because the baby AI we have today is creating billions and billions and billions of dollars for, for Google and Facebook and all these companies, but at the same time, is being used to you know, uh, you know, reduce uh, democracy and, 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 and keep thousands and thousands of people out of jobs. So we need to, to think about the implications or the outcomes of the AI that, uh, machine learning that we have today. Yeah, thanks, Alex. I think, too, that, again, tying it all together, if, if the robotic process automation takes off in directions because it isn't managed and enables machines that build machines to go build machines that then go do what they're programmed to do, then it's a runaway train. Uh, not, not evil, just not managed. And so... That's the part that I think is the scary side of this. And I, I'm, my goal would be to, yeah, let's be aware of that and let's do everything we can to avoid that, but let's focus more on what can we do with this that's positive. And, and we've hit all over that today, so I like that. Nancy, back to you then quickly on this other question because we're gonna get the high sign here uh, unless Lindsay's already given it. Uh, <laughs> we're right on point there. A quick answer here, Nancy, and then I'll give some closing comments and, and we'll do the baton toss. Uh, back to the question I asked earlier, uh, what can what can we do to prepare for the workplace of the future? Thoughts? Uh, this is right up your sweet spot, I know. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, really building on what we've said, get involved. Um, I mean, the, the obviously the discussion today, the comments I've seen in the chat, you know, people are asking and thinking about this in the right way. I think we need to stop thinking about AI as a technology and think about it as a you know, a social phenomenon, um, you know, or at least introduce that thinking. So, you know, I have people say to me, oh, I don't know anything about AI. I'm not a coder. I'm not a technologist. And you don't need to be. What we need is people with all of those thoughts going, you know, what might the implications of this be? How might this affect my life or the lives of people I can envisage who might be helped or hindered by this? Um, so get involved, you know, join, join some AI think tanks, join some groups. You don't have to know how to write Python or, you know, <laughs> be, a, be a super geek to have views on this. Um, and it's really important, as Scott said, that we're not just all the super geeks having views on this because we might, we might not have enough representation. So, you know, volunteer. I, I'll make a pitch for, a, if you're in the UK, there's an organization called We and AI. I'll put a link in the chat in a second. And we're working exactly in this area to engage people, to educate them, to get them to be part of the conversation, even if they don't feel it's necessarily their area of expertise. So, um, you know, get involved and share your thoughts and, and concerns with those groups would be my, my advice. 
All right. Thank you, Nancy. I'm, I'm going to jump us into some concluding comments. And I, I, um, I anticipated where we're going to some degree. And some of this I've thought through. Uh, some of it is changing on the fly from where we went. But three or four bullet points, and then we'll uh, do the baton toss. It really, I think it isn't a question of will AI be the end of work, but rather that AI is going to contribute to the continuous industrial revolution that we've been in like other technologies over the last couple hundred years, as we expand our understanding of how to advance society, both economically as organizations and um, as, as people who are driven societally. And yet it's kind of different this time. The promise of AI is still that, it's a promise, and yet it's accelerating its ability to deliver and we had best be ready for it. So it, it sounds like from this discussion, we conclude that there's there is no replacing human intelligence, but we agree that there are many elements of intelligent human acts that can be processed by machines that have been trained to adapt to changing requirements and according to recognizable patterns. And in the quest to be good stewards of that, which is where we find ourselves now, uh, of both the society and the value of that and drive our economic prosperity and equity that we seek for everybody, uh, we need to look ahead to the opportunities and the dilemmas that AI presents and be ready to lead and not become a victim to our own cleverness. That's, that's my uh, final plea in terms of how we work our way out of this. With that, I'm going to post this slide and look to Lindsay to hand this over to Sean to pick up the next session here quickly. Uh, Lindsay, anything from you? I was Thank just you, Laura, going. And I'm going to hand over to Augustine, who takes over as captain right now. But oh, a captain, a captain handoff and a speaker handoff. It's a double whammy. I'm glad to have witnessed that. Uh, panel, well, thank you again. Thank you. Gordon, just want to say hi for your uh, magnificent uh, type.